On the fringe of a desert wasteland, the mighty Sea of Cortez is the domain of a predator the locals call El Tiburon, the shark. Also known as man-eater and white death, the great white is the most mysterious inhabitant of this desert sea. Where they come from and why they are here is what scientists hope to discover as they investigate Mexico's legendary population of great whites. Its massive size is enough to block out the desert sun, but the whale shark is a gentle giant. These sharks comb the Sea of Cortez, engaging in one of nature's most unusual feeding habits. The deep blue waters off Mexico's arid coast are also home to what may be the smartest fish in the sea. There, a scientist journeys into the world of the manta ray, shedding new light on these graceful creatures. The Galapagos shark also roams Mexico's amazing undersea world, a place where predators and humans square off on a collision course that may threaten the shark's very survival. It is a land of contradictions, miles of parched, inhospitable desert bordering on one of the world's most abundant marine habitats, the Sea of Cortez. Underwater, the contradictions continue. Great white sharks roam here, in waters generally perceived as too warm to support these great fish. For years, it was believed only female great whites were found in the Sea of Cortez, sharks that migrated down from cold northern latitudes to give birth. But when several adult male sharks were recently captured in the region, scientists wondered where these sharks came from and what brought them to a desert sea. What experts know for sure is that the prehistoric relatives of the great white patrolled this region for some 65 million years. On land, once underwater, a scientist is literally digging up the history of the white sharks in the Sea of Cortez. Gerardo Barba has collected hundreds of fossilized shark teeth inside this phosphate mine. The strip mining has exposed layers of prehistoric seafloor, littered with evidence of white sharks and their prey. This is a good locality to collect uh, great white sharks' relatives because uh, there's a abundance of uh, whales in the fossils, complete skeletons. So we have he here the prey, we have the predator. Alive or dead, whales have been a source of food for white sharks in the Sea of Cortez for millions of years. Today, Modern great whites are known to satisfy much of their diet through scavenging, and according to experts, whales are on the top of the menu. This rapidly decomposing Brutus whale contains enough high-calorie blubber to sustain a white shark for long periods. The abundance of whales found in the Sea of Cortez may be partly what attracts great whites here from thousands of miles away. At his lab in La Paz, Barba has pieced together the history of the white shark with his collection of teeth, all found in Baja. Finding the fossils was only the first step Barbara and other paleontologists around the world are using teeth to determine which shark ancestors led to the great white of today, and which are evolutionary dead ends. But the scientific community remains divided. Many believe white sharks emerged from a prehistoric mako shark that led to today's great white. A second theory contends the great white evolved from this giant, Carcharodon megalodon. The most notorious of the prehistoric sharks, megalodon's epic size made it the largest and most lethal predator known to science. But unlike the great white, the megalodon was believed to be a strictly warm water shark 
which may have died out because the whales it fed upon migrated to colder Arctic regions where the megalodon could not follow. A side-by-side -side comparison of modern great white shark and megalodon teeth shows subtle but distinct differences in the serrated edges and the shape of the root. Such differences are enough to convince many experts that the megalodon is not the granddaddy of the modern white shark. The fossil record tells scientists that great whites and their relatives have inhabited the Sea of Cortez for millions of years. But ironically, almost nothing is known about white sharks that inhabit the region today. The prevailing theory suggests white sharks use the Sea of Cortez merely as a pit stop in a long migration. Female great whites, resident to Northern California, are believed to move into the waters of Southern California and Mexico to give birth. Shark attack records substantiate a southerly presence. A fatal 1994 attack near Santa Barbara a fatal 1989 attack off Malibu, and attacks at Guadalupe Island in 1973 and 84. But along with female white sharks, males have also been found here, a new discovery that has brought an American shark scientist to investigate. He believes the presence of both male and female white sharks in the Sea of Cortez may indicate a permanent year-round population here, but so far, solid evidence has been difficult to find. People don't think of the Sea of Cortez as a place where you find great white sharks, but they're here. A mounting pile of evidence proves it. Unfortunately, it's a pile of bones. It's all from dead animals, just tidbits. We really need to find out where the live ones are. Some reliable evidence that male great whites visit the Sea of Cortez comes from Vincente Lucero, who in 30 years of shark fishing has caught several large adult males and has the photographs to prove it. Several years earlier, Lucero encountered a large great white entangled in his net. As he attempted to pull the shark on board his tiny boat, it was savagely attacked by a second great white. By the time Lucero pulled his shark on board, it had been badly bitten. But as the photos show, it clearly possessed male sex organs called claspers. So this shark was how big? Uh, uh, quantos metros? Seis metros. Seis. Cinco, uno. Ah, seis. Six, six meters. Seis, seis. That is a big seis. shark. Seis metros. And you, uh, you say that it was a male shark, uh, uh, hombre. Sí, 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 sí. Hombre shark. Muy grande, big class. Sí, sí, sí. Wow. For several generations, the family of Vincente Lucero has made their living fishing the shark abundant waters in the central sea of Cortez. <laughs> Nothing was wasted. Every part of this large thresher shark was utilized or sold. With little fishing impact, shark stock stayed healthy year after year. In 1993, a fishing fleet of 100 boats arrived here, created to meet the overseas demand for fins. In only three years, the fleet killed thousands of sharks, commercially destroying the local stocks. Five years later, the Lucero family is still waiting for the predators to return. The sharks that helped support them for generations were destroyed for quick profits. The demand for fins used to make the Asian delicacy shark fin soup continues to keep the pressure on sharks throughout Mexico. Like many developing countries, Mexico faces the challenge of balancing the needs of a rapidly escalating population with protection of its valuable resources. Shark fins are the currency in these situations worldwide, and people are trying to go in one generation from living the lives they have in the past to living the way we live in America, and sharks are paying the balance. Uh, whether or not that's greedy, uh, I wouldn't judge, but the sharks are disappearing.
and it's up to governments to decide uh, how to manage their resources responsibly. In an effort to find live white sharks in the Sea of Cortez, Rocky Strong has journeyed to an archipelago of remote desert islands called the Midriffs. The nearly rainless climate has made these desolate pinnacles hot, dry, and uninhabitable for humans. But the cool waters surrounding the isles are very inviting to large predators and their prey. This is an ideal place for white sharks. Um, good deep water right next to shore, lots and lots of sea lions and cold water. It's especially cold right now. The powerful cold water currents that rip through the Midriff Islands are a result of strong desert winds and deep water upwellings. The hellish conditions above water give little indication of the heavenly environment below. If great whites have rebounded from years of fishing pressure, Strong believes the midriffs are an ideal place to find them. The robust population of California sea lions that reside on San Esteban Island are undoubtedly the white shark's favorite prey in this region. But unlike slower moving, less agile elephant seals that the white shark preys upon in northern latitudes, the sea lions are very difficult to catch and kill. The shark's best hope for a successful hunt is utilizing the element of surprise, cruising along the dark, rocky bottom while camouflaged by his equally dark back. Because the predator often fails to capture such elusive prey, Strong believes white sharks here have adapted their diet to include a higher proportion of fish. In the meantime, the scientist observes and photographs the curious sea lions, examining their bodies for wounds that may indicate a failed shark attack. Okay. Chance. Here we go. Positioned just offshore near the seal colony, Strong launches an anti-shark cage. If white sharks linger below, a potent concoction of minced tuna will bring them up to investigate. But after days of baiting and descending to the cage to look out for signs of a shark, Strong did not encounter a single great white. Unlike Australia and South Africa, where the presence of white sharks can be reasonably predicted based on previous studies, the predators here have proven elusive. Alarmingly, the lack of any large sharks in this well-known shark area indicates to Strong that overfishing has once again played a major role in explaining the shark's absence. The only sign of a predator in this deserted desert sea is the appearance of a Mexican horn shark. Despite their small size, these harmless bottom-dwelling sharks are also targeted by commercial fisheries. Though Strong has studied hundreds of California horn sharks, this specimen is the first he has encountered in the Sea of Cortez. Without harming the shark, he will bring it to the surface to photograph and record its vital statistics. Strong's groundbreaking study of California horn sharks was the first to demonstrate how the animal's diet affects the coloration of both its thin spines and teeth. My first Mexican horn shark. I'm pretty excited to find that, that even here in, uh, in the Sea of Cortez, 
they eat a lot of ur urchins that turn their uh, fin spines purple. Fin spines in their teeth. They're as purple as he can be. Taking a closer look, Strong discovers a tiny creature has taken residence in the horn shark's gills. It's a parasite, huh? Uh, isopod. I've never seen one quite like that. With the destructive parasite removed for further study, the shark is released unharmed. Like the great white, much of its life history in this desert sea is a mystery. While an ideal marine climate with ample food sources may have hinted at a white shark presence, evidence from fishermen has now confirmed great whites in the Sea of Cortez. But whether white sharks are here permanently or merely visitors passing through is the question scientists like Rocky Strong will continue to explore. Big males may actually live here too. If they live here, are they migrating from somewhere else, or is there a population that lives here all year round? Do they stay in the deep cold waters out here in the central Cortez and only come up into the shallows to try to, uh, to fill their tummies now and again? They may be lurking in the deep, deep trenches, basically, of the Sea of Cortez, but their numbers and how the population works here remains virtually completely unknown. floats through the clouds, not a vapor, but clouds of microscopic plankton that blanket the Sea of Cortez. The massive form of the whale shark harvesting its tiny prey is a common sight in this desert sea, a place where the giant fish is found in prolific numbers. In the warm, protected waters of the southern Sea of Cortez, whale sharks gather. Sometimes only a few hundred yards offshore of the bustling little city of La Paz. The sharks are here to feed and spend much of the daylight hours slowly cruising along the surface in search of prey. From above, their immense contours are unmistakable. The largest of all sharks, one specimen was said to be 59 feet long and weigh over 90,000 pounds. Local dive master, Rocio Lozano, has spent years observing whale sharks off La Paz. While leading groups of divers and ecotourists on expeditions to meet these gargantuan fish face to face. We have an adult uh, whale shark here, which is about 25 feet. And um, he's feeding, obviously, he has a mouth wide open, surface bolting. Right behind, we have two little ones, very small. I can't see very clear, but they're very small and close to each other. There's no other fish larger than a whale shark. It's the largest fish in the world's oceans. So to see a whale shark is to see the, the best, pretty much, for many divers. Personally, swimming with a whale shark is, was, the first time especially, it was uh, unreal. It was, I was so excited, and my heart kept beating, and it was just very emotional, it was very nice. Though the whale shark's size causes it to be confused with true whales, physiologically it is very much a shark using its gills for respiration and reproducing by hatching live young internally. But behaviorally, the whale shark is very unshark-like. This harmless, almost toothless giant prefers to harvest its prey from the sea in the methodic, tireless pace of a combine tractor. Physical conditions are ideal in this part of the bay and other regions within the Sea of Cortez so that uh, food is gathered by currents. The plankton is uh, accumulated in certain regions and it's easy for them to find it. 
What the whale shark finds in abundance here are mosquito size invertebrae, known collectively as zooplankton, 90% of which are creatures called copepods. Like moths drawn to a flame, these copepods are lured by the light of the sun, gathering at the surface where the whale shark literally vacuums them from the sea with a powerful sucking motion. The giant gills flutter rhythmically as the water is forced through and the tiny plankton are left behind, caught as if in a huge sieve and then quickly swallowed. Due to their immense size, adult whale sharks have no natural enemies. But because they spend most of their time slowly swimming near the surface, they have been easy targets for shark fisheries worldwide. Currently, the whale shark does not enjoy protected status in Mexican waters, though Rocio and other shark experts are working for the passage of new laws. The government is interested in preserving uh, Mexico's wildlife, or particularly the Sea of Cortez wildlife, not only because it will bring uh, money into the country, but basically because they care for preserving it. What conservationists hope to avoid here is the establishment of whale shark fisheries that have nearly wiped out the animal elsewhere. In other developing countries, rampant poverty and a declining human condition have given these burgeoning fisheries a toehold. Off India alone, over a thousand whale sharks were recently taken in one year for their fins and meat. And in the Philippines, whale sharks have been threatened by a decade of slaughter. Leaping from small boats, hunters drove harpoons into the backs of the sharks to sever their spines. Sharks were then towed back to villages where the meat was butchered. The fins were removed and sold to Taiwanese dealers. But as the demand for fins increased, so did the hunting. And in a few years, shark stocks plummeted by up to 80%. Then, after an American filmmaker, Erin Kalmis, documented the hunting in 1998, her unique video helped convince the Philippine government to put an immediate halt to the hunting. Today, the whale sharks are in even more demand alive as hunting is being replaced by the rapidly growing new eco-tourist industry of whale shark watching. In Japan, the popularity of whale shark watching has boomed since the Osaka Aquarium became one of the first facilities in the world to successfully house the creatures. Inside the aquarium's three-story high acrylic tank, two whale sharks, a 28-foot female and a 16-foot male, are the marquee performers delighting capacity crowds that have numbered in the millions, making these massive fish among Japan's most popular tourist attractions. Capturing this giant was no easy task. Aquarium staff and biologists needed luck and the lure of bait to bring the 15-foot shark inside their dragnet. Once aboard the specially designed transport, the delicate cargo was monitored continuously by biologists. Time and a quick relocation to the aquarium were critical to the animal's survival. Safely arriving in Osaka, the shark was released into its new home and escorted by divers to ensure it would not crash into the unfamiliar acrylic walls. Today, five years later, 
the female has nearly doubled in size and has been such a success that a small male was added to the aquarium. At breakfast and dinner, the crew wheels over 40 pounds of premium seafood to the top of the aquarium. And amazingly, the whale sharks know they are coming. At the precise feeding times each day, the whale sharks rapidly circle near the top of the tank like anxious puppies begging for a biscuit. Reacting precisely to the sound of the bucket slapping the water, these colossal fish display an almost mammalian level of intelligence that has made them so popular here. The same kind of interactions with humans has made whale sharks equally popular in the Sea of Cortez. But according to naturalist Rocio Lozano, chasing whale sharks and grabbing on for a ride may be doing harm to the animals. I have seen them harassed by people and they just take off really fast and go very deep. With the increase in ecotourism and whale shark diving, Rocio believes laws prohibiting harassment, including hanging on the fins and chasing the sharks, are needed, even though these animals could quite easily leave humans in their wake. According to her, continued harassment of the animals by using them like underwater taxis could drive the whale sharks away from the Bay of La Paz, eventually altering the animals' feeding patterns and potentially doing damage to the health of the species. I don't think people should touch wildlife, first of all. We should have respect for nature. It's not something that is there for us to entertain ourselves with. We have to take it as something that is there for us to admire. From Cabo San Lucas on the southernmost tip of Baja, a scientific expedition embarks on a journey to one of the most prolific but remote shark habitats on Earth. The goal for shark expert Rocky Strong and expedition leader Rocio Lozano is to observe and record the populations of sharks and rays at the Revilla Hojedo Island chain, known worldwide as a mecca for very large and very aggressive predators. 220 miles south of Baja, the Revilla Hojedos are rugged volcanic mountains that rise sharply from the floor of the eastern Pacific. The deep water that surrounds the islands attracts massive schools of pelagic Pacific tuna, jacks, and other fishes in such abundance and variety that these islands have been called the Galapagos of Mexico. A dangerous 36-hour boat ride from the mainland, the archipelago lies unprotected in the open Pacific and is often bashed by hurricanes and rough seas. This inaccessibility has helped to protect animals including the giant Pacific mantas from human intrusion, as the islands are only reachable by boat a few weeks a year. Close cousins to sharks, the graceful mantas are attracted to the islands by vast quantities of plankton on which they feed, and the presence of cleaner fish that rid them of parasites. Nowhere else in the world are these giants found in greater abundance. Strong and his crew will conduct observations of the mantas near the ash-covered volcanic island of San Benedicto. Just offshore, the mantas gather to circle a submerged underwater pinnacle known as the Boiler, a legendary dive site where the animals readily swim and interact with people. The apparent friendliness of the mantas and their willingness to be ridden by divers has helped them shed the long-standing and ill-fitting nickname of devilfish. Manta rays were uh, nicknamed devilfish back in the days before people really got in the water with them. Mainly fishermen, I feel sure fishermen gave them that name. Guys who would see these horned creatures passing by their boat occasionally get tangled in their gear and occasionally give them a ride, actually get hung in their nets and pull them for miles. The domain of the manta is a sheer rock cliff that plunges vertically into the abyss. 
mantas orbit the pinnacle near the surface, graceful swimmers that appear to exist in a slow motion liquid dream. Their massive wings beat slowly, displacing enough water to propel them at moderate speeds. Like their close cousins, the sharks, mantas appear to be curious about divers and will often slow their pace to investigate. The differences between sharks and rays are basically morphological. There aren't many physiological differences. They're very similar in the ways their bodies work, in the ways their sensory systems work. It's just the shape of their body and the way the things are arranged. You could say that a manta is basically a flattened shark with very tiny teeth. The manta has developed horns that are unique in the animal kingdom. The horns curl up to reduce drag when swimming and unfurl when the animal is feeding, like a pair of hands helping to guide its prey of tiny fish and plankton into its mouth. Because mantas are so large, with wingspans of 20 feet and weights of over a ton, they have little to fear from predators. Small mantas are probably susceptible to predation by sharks, their own cousins, and, and some large predaceous fish. Mantas' best defense is their size, and they don't have stingers. They're, they're essentially harmless, uh, big, gentle giants. Mantas have the biggest brains of, of any cartilaginous fish, basically the biggest brains of any fish in the sea, and do appear to possess some degree of intelligence, and that's evidenced when, when they encounter divers under the water. If they're not threatened, they tend to come back and, uh, and join in voluntary interactions with the people, much in the way the dolphins do. The migration pattern of these animals is a complete mystery to biologists. Strong hopes that by planting ID tags on the mantas here, those patterns can be better understood. Everything we know about the behavior of large manta rays suggests that at some point in the year, these animals probably pick up and go. The question is, where would they go? Do they come up into the Sea of Cortez? Do they go on down closer to the equator? Uh, so tagging a manta, just putting a, a number on the animal, if that number is, is recovered, uh, we know when, when and where we tagged them, uh, where they went and how fast they got there. But planting the tag will not be easy. Each time Strong approaches the playful creature, it loops and rolls away from him. The scientist's biggest concern is finding the ideal area in which to attach the tag. Since scientists can't ask the animals, does this hurt, we always have to do the most conservative thing. You watch their behavior when you apply a tag, you minimize the, the size of the tag, but you don't want to hurt the animal. Using a pole spear, Strong applies the tag, then watches. It seems to have had little effect on the manta, a creature armed with extremely tough skin. It's almost like asphalt. It's like pavement. It's thick, hard stuff. But back towards the tail, where we usually tag them, their bodies are very soft, and they're sensitive to the touch, and they flinch when you touch them. The fin back there is about the best place to locate a tag. As more are tagged and the tags recited, scientists will begin to get a clearer picture of the day-to-day -day lives of the creatures so wrongly labeled devilfish. For now, the manta is an engaging mystery, arriving seemingly from nowhere, disappearing on a whim, inviting us to fly alongside its silent, graceful wings. In search of sharks, the expedition moves to Socorro Island, where their small boat is sheltered from relentless Pacific swells. 
These massive waves have created a powerful blowhole that blasts water up through the rock some 300 feet above sea level. So what's the name of this in Spanish? Well, in general, we call blowhole bufadora. Oh, bufadora. Like bufa. Since its discovery in 1533, the island has remained largely uninhabited by humans. But just offshore, cave-dwelling white-tip reef sharks are long-term residents. White tips are one of the only sharks that exhibit a home cave behavior, returning to the same cave time after time. This white-tip reef shark has taken shelter in a small cave, sharing his humble abode with the Socorro spiny lobster, one of his favorite prey items. Because the shark is a juvenile, the king-sized lobster may be unwilling to vacate, so it is the shark that moves on. Unlike many species which must swim constantly to breed, the white tip can remain stationary when at rest by pumping water over its gills. At night, the white tips emerge from their caves to hunt. And though small, they are aggressive and have even been known to attack spear fishermen. One of the only schooling sharks is the mysterious scalloped hammerhead. These shy predators are extremely wary of humans and will not allow Rocky and Rocio to approach. A single hammerhead breaks off to glide among a school of jacks. Like zebras in the Serengeti, which casually walk among lethargic lions, the jacks seem to sense the shark is not in the hunting mode. To conserve energy, Sharks are normally in cruise control, but when feeding opportunities surface, the predators instantly switch into high gear. These opportunities often begin when smaller fish loudly compete for food. Noises in the water tend to be the kinds of things that, that bring sharks the fastest. Bony fish are really noisy little swimmers, and sharks hear this commotion and know that an opportunity might be afoot uh, and just come streaking in to see what's up. Silvertip sharks are fast, large, and bold. Strong must keep a wary eye in all directions for these potentially dangerous predators. From the other direction, a dozen or more Galapagos sharks have been drawn in and are swimming rapidly, signaling aggression. This species is also potentially dangerous, blamed for at least one human death. Galapagos sharks are found at island chains around the world, but do not dwell near the continental mainlands. How these sharks got from one island chain to the next, and why they prefer islands over the mainland, are two of the many unsolved shark mysteries marine biologists are attempting to solve. For nearly two weeks, Strong continues his shark census with consistent sightings of fewer, smaller, and less aggressive sharks compared with observations he made here 10 years earlier. Worried about the apparent decline, Strong decides to use bait in hopes of drawing in any sharks that might be in the area. The plan is to plant the makeshift cage on a boulder and quickly move away. Like a ticking time bomb, the cage must be handled cautiously. At any moment, its contents could ignite a frenzy among the rapidly approaching sharks. Wave after wave of Galapagos sharks arrive. Mostly sub-adult, the sharks are normally timid when alone. But in a crowd competing for fish, they become bolder and more aggressive. 
Divers should never take small sharks for granted, that's for sure. A four-foot Galapagos shark could certainly cause a, a deadly injury. And in a place like the Rabiahijados, if you do have an attack, you're 200 miles from help. When you're in a dangerous situation with, with sharks, uh, and you know that help is very far away. Uh, things to keep in mind are, are what's going on around you all the time, 360 degrees, and basically uh, where you can go for cover if, uh, if everything breaks loose all of a sudden. The situation has become hazardous. Strong decides the safest course of action is to open the cage and give the frustrated predators what they came for. Until the bait is dispersed, the divers will not attempt to surface. bait definitely had the desired effect. So no question we had uh, 10 little Galapagos sharks, one or two silver tips. Pretty hungry sharks once the food got loose. So we opened the cage and let the food out. They, uh, they competed pretty, pretty strongly for it. It's not so much the, the presence of the juveniles that's interesting, it's the absence of the bigger sharks, which fortunately we saw some of on this dive. But there should be more big sharks here. The lack of large sharks here is debatable, but time and again, most evidence points to illegal fishing. I was in the Rabiahijados 10 years ago, and there were many, many more sharks there. These days, I can't find enough sharks to make it dangerous anymore. That's not a thrill seeker kind of thing. That's, that's in the interest of getting some science done. The possibility is that, that some natural changes have taken place and there are cyclic fluctuations that account for what you're seeing, but a, a pattern is definitely setting in that's, that's cause for concern. Though Mexican law restricts them from fishing within 12 miles of the islands, commercial boats still illegally work these waters. Population studies may heighten awareness of the plight of the shark but it will be up to Mexico's government to enforce laws and enact stiffer fines to curb illegal slaughter. Even in this remote sanctuary, sharks are being killed faster than they can replace themselves. Worldwide, the race to save the shark is crucial. The balance and overall health of our oceans depends on their survival. <laughs>